to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 20. We welcome you today to our study of more about Jesus. In this series of lessons, we've been thinking about the life of Christ and trying to be more like Him. And today, we're thinking about the narrow-minded Jesus. Jesus was narrow-minded on certain subjects. In fact, you will often hear Jesus say, verily, verily, truly, truly, unless, if and only if is the idea. idea. These are the things that, that Jesus definitely felt strongly about. And so that's what we're going to think about from the New Testament today. And so we want to encourage you to get your Bible. If you don't have it out already, go get your Bible, have it ready, locate it, have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together in our study about the narrow-minded Jesus. As always, we're so happy that you've joined us for our Bible study today. Uh, today's lessons are being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to visit their assembly, whether it be on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night at Bible study. Visit the Church of Christ in your area. You'll find people there who love God who are concerned about lost souls and who want to know the truth and do what God says more than anything else. And so if you've got a Bible question, you want to know more about what must I do to be saved or what, what do we know about the church or the Bible or how should Christians worship, you'll find people at the church in your area who would love to sit down and study the scriptures with you. Just open the Bible and see what God says. And so again, we encourage you to check out the church of the Lord Jesus Christ in your area. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, which is a work of the Lord's Church, we'd love to help you in your study of the Scriptures. If you'd like to have a copy of this series, more about Jesus, or any of our past series, we've got lessons on every book of the Old Testament, every book of the New Testament, and a wide plethora of topical studies as well. And so if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, we make those available free of charge. You can get a digital download uh, from our website, or if you need a CD or a DVD, we'll be happy to send that to you in the mail free of charge as well. If you got a Bible question, we'd love to help you as well. Something you'd like for us to maybe do a lesson on, we'd be glad to do that also. We just want to encourage everyone to let the Bible be the focal point in everything we do and say in religious matters. Let's now turn our attention to the narrow-minded Jesus. What are some things Jesus was narrow-minded or, or constricted about? And, and what things do we need to also be narrow-minded in our thinking about? I want you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 5. One thing Jesus was definitely narrow-minded about, and this is the verse that we began with, is righteous living. So open your Bible to Matthew chapter 5, verse number 20, and I want you to hear what Jesus said about the way a Christian has to live his life. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said this, For I say to you, unless, listen to the definite now, unless, your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Friend, Jesus was definitely narrow-minded about how a follower of His needs to live His life. Now, why would Jesus say, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. I thought those people were the scholars in the law and the religious elite of their day. 
Well, in some ways they were, but in other ways they put tradition above the Word of God. Mark chapter 7, Matthew chapter 15. They would go halfway around the world to make a proselyte and then make him twice as much. A son of hell as themselves, Jesus would say in Matthew 23. Uh, Jesus said that the, these people were like whitewashed tombs, beautiful, ornate on the outside. Inwardly, they were full of dead men's bones. These people were the hypocrites of Jesus' day. And friend, please hear this well. If there's one thing Jesus spoke out against over and over and over again, it was hypocritical living. There's a lot of people in the world who, when they're around others, when everybody's watching, like the, the Pharisees uh, praying on the street corner in Matthew 6, when everybody's watching, they are the most upright, righteous, religious people in the world. When everybody turns away, they go to living like the devil. Friend, Jesus was absolutely narrow-minded on righteous living. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Does that mean we can't go to heaven? No, it's not the idea. Jesus is just saying, don't be a hypocrite. Live what you believe every day. What you are at home ought to be the same thing you are in public, ought to be the same thing you are on Sunday at worship. And Jesus is the prime example of this. Luke 2, verse 49, uh, Jesus said, I must be about my Father's business. Luke 9, 23, if any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Jesus wants us to live for him every day. Galatians 2, 20, Paul epitomized that. He said, I've been crucified with Christ. What's that mean? No longer I who live, Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. We need to be a living sacrifice for Jesus Christ every day. Secondly, Jesus was narrow-minded about being converted to the truth. Look in your Bible in Matthew. I want you to turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18 with me. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew, chapter 18, We'll read verses 1 through 4 together. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, sat me in the midst of them and said, Listen to these words, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as a little child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. What's Jesus trying to get at here? Jesus was narrow-minded about being converted. The disciples have this mentality of greatness. Who's going to be the greatest? Who's going to sit on the right hand and the left? John's mother and John and, and them wanted to know that. Who's going to be the best disciple, the one with the most clout? You said, whoa, 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 that's not how it works. And there's a little child standing around Jesus' disciples. You can imagine some little toddler, three, four, five years old, innocent, helpless, completely dependent upon his parents, no sin, no guile. He says, come here, little child. That little child comes over, and he puts him right out in the front as an object lesson. You can see Jesus place both of his hands on this little child. As the child looks around at the disciples, and he says, unless you guys become like this little child, you're, unless you're converted and become like this little child, there's no way you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven. What's Jesus trying to get at? You've got to humble yourself. You've got to realize you need God. He's not in need of you. You've got to realize I need the mentality that whatever God says I need to do, I need to do it. And I need to realize I'm an unprofitable servant. Luke 17, 10. All my righteousness in and of itself is like filthy rags. I've tr to be converted, you've got to realize how low you are. Without God, how much you need Him and how that ought to humble you in your life to put full trust and faith in God. And friend, the last thing you want to do is think you're better than anybody else. Someone's right. I don't know who said it, but someone said it and it has always stuck with me. All men stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. There is no big me and little you or little you and little me and big you. There's no clergy laity. There's no rank in that sense. Jesus is the head of the church. We're all his followers 
to be converted, I need the mindset that I was at rock bottom. I need God. I need to have that innocence and that converted attitude that Jesus mentioned here. Third thing Jesus was narrow-minded about, Jesus was narrow-minded on the essentiality of repentance. Turn to the Gospel of Luke with me, and I want you to see what Jesus says here. Luke chapter 13. You're now going to hear one of those verily, verily, truly, truly statements of Jesus, uh, one of the emphatic statements that He makes. Look at Luke chapter 13. We'll read verses 1 through 5 together. The Bible says there were present at that season some who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled uh, with their sacrifice or mixed with their sacrifices. And Jesus answered and said to them, Do you suppose these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you'll all likes, likes perish. Or those 18, on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think they were worse sinners than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? And again, Jesus says, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Now, what you've got is people looking at others and saying, boy, they were really bad, and I'm glad I weren't those, I'm not those people, and that was God's vengeance. Those Galileans who at the time of sacrifice, Pilate killed them, and their blood was mixed with the sacrificial blood, that was the vengeance of God on those bad, bad sinners. Or those 18 people who are just walking down the road, and out of nowhere a tower falls on them, there's God striking those wicked people down. So they asked Jesus, or were, they were sinners and everybody else, and Jesus said, no. And unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Did they hear the emphatic nature of personal responsibility there? Stop worrying. Stop worrying about everything everybody else may be doing. I'm not saying that there's not right and wrong. We shouldn't be concerned about that. But as it relates to my relationship with God and how good I am in His sight, stop looking at other people and say, boy, they're really bad and I'm not that bad. Jesus said, unless you repent you will all likewise perish. What's that remind us of? Friend, it reminds me that I'm a sinner in need of the love and the grace and the mercy of God. It, it reminds me, because I'm a sinner, I'm no better than anybody else. You see, the Bible teaches there's none righteous. Romans 3 verse 10. The Bible teaches that there's a way that seems right to a man, in thereof is the way of death. Proverbs 16, verse 25. The Scripture teaches there's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin. Everybody, from who we might think of as the most righteous all the way to those who we might think of living in the depths of despair and sin, they're no better or no worse off than one person who's sinned. We all are in need of a repentant, a penitent heart. I, I, I think of the words of Joel 2 verse 13. You see, the Jews were great at the outward sign of appearance. They were great at acting like and putting on a sad face and woe is me type of mentality. And Joel said, rend your hearts. You really want to turn to God? Rend your hearts, not your garments. A changed life, a penitent life is what God wants. And friend, penitence is more than just shedding tears. Luke chapter 3, verses about verses 3 through 8. Certain people came out to be baptized by John, and you read from the context, it's just because everybody was doing it. It was popular, so they thought if everybody's doing it, we ought to do it. And John said to those religious elite who weren't penitent, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then he said this, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. A life of penitence is shown by your actions. Am I saying we're going to be perfect? That's not the idea. But I'm trying. I'm trying to do better. I'm trying to live right. I know I'm a sinner. I know I need God's grace, but I'm trying every day to do better and to live right and to be what God wants me to be. Let's now turn our attention to another thing Jesus was definitely narrow-minded about. I want you to open to the Gospel of John. Take your New Testament and open with me to John chapter 3. Jesus was definitely 
on multiple occasions, narrow-minded on the necessity and essentiality of baptism. Look at Jesus' discussion with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, I want you to look in verses 1 through 5. The Bible says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Most assuredly, verily, verily, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus is confused. Verse 4, he said to him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What was Jesus narrow-minded about? Being born again. Unless you are born again, you cannot. Get into the kingdom. You're not going to heaven, Jesus said. You're not getting in my kingdom. You're not going to be a part of God's kingdom. You're not going to the next life in that kingdom if you haven't been born again. And Dick and Ema says, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute, Lord. What do you mean born again? How can a man my age be born again? You want me to go back in my mother's womb? That's biologically impossible, Lord. You know that, right? And Jesus just cuts to the chase. Unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. We are born again by the Word of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23 through 25, which is inspired by the Spirit of God, born of water and Spirit. And friend, you've got to be born again of water as well. Now what in the world does that mean? Jesus said in Mark 16, verse 16, He that believes, and is baptized will be saved. Throughout the New Testament, our Lord was narrow-minded and specific about the essentiality of baptism. You say, okay, that's all good and well, but how's baptism a new birth? Let me show you. Romans 6, verses 1 through 4, Jesus describes the death, burial, and resurrection, the new birth process. We die to sin, we are buried with Christ in baptism, and we come up out of that. We are born again, resurrected, to walk in newness of life. We are a new creature when we come up out of that. Acts twenty two sixteen. 16, Saul of Tarsus was told, Why are you waiting? Arise to be baptized and wash away your sins. The person who comes up from obeying God out of the water of baptism is like a baby in the sense that he's been cleansed, he's washed, he's pure, and he's innocent at that point. And friend, Jesus taught, listen carefully to me now. Jesus said you've got to be baptized to be saved. He said you've got to be born of water to get into his kingdom. Uh, Peter taught you had to repent be baptized for the remission of sins, Acts 2 verse 38. Paul said to get into Christ... We had to be baptized, had to be baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27. It's where we contact the death of Christ, Romans 6, 3 through 4. And Peter said, because of everything we've said up to this point, baptism does now also save us. Jesus was narrow-minded about being born of water and the Spirit. And friend, if you're going to become a child of God, we've got to follow what Jesus said to be saved. Jesus was also narrow-minded on the fullness and the inspiration of God's divine Word. I want you to look in Matthew 26, and, and I want you to hear what Jesus said about the fullness and inspiration of Scripture. Look in Matthew chapter 26. Look at what Jesus said in verse number 54. Jesus said, as he talked about what was going to happen with his death and all these things, Jesus said, how then could the scripture be fulfilled that it must happen this way? Jesus believed that, that what was occurring, people gathering together, they're going to put him before Pilate, he's going to be crucified. This was the way it was going to happen, and it had to happen this way. What's he saying? He believed the scriptures were complete and full 
and inspired by God. In one place, in John chapter 5, Jesus would say, the scripture cannot be broken. Friend, when I think about things Jesus was narrow-minded about, Jesus realized because God said it, it had to happen this way. He realized when the scripture says it, that's it, and you can't change that. Friend, we want to realize today the importance of God's divinely inspired word. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And friend, Jesus was also narrow-minded as it related to the Word of God about our need to recognize Him and God's Word as the final authority. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Jesus, God's Word, the Bible, that's how we're going to be saved. It's divinely inspired. It's our roadmap to heaven itself. Jesus was also narrow-minded as it relates to His second coming. I want you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 24. We know that Jesus came to this earth, that He, he was buried, he died, and that He rose again. But Jesus also taught He's coming again. And He was very narrow-minded about that fact. Look at Matthew 24, verse number 36. Jesus said, but of that day, concerning his coming, but of that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Jesus realized he was coming again, and he wanted us to believe that and to know that as well. And so as we think about things Jesus was narrow-minded about, friend, he absolutely believed. You've got to be ready. Mark 13, 35, What I say unto you, I say unto all, watch, be ready. He's coming back. There's a day when all men will stand before the throne of God, Matthew 25. Each of us will give an account for the things done in the body, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5, and then we'll be separated, right? The left, good and the bad, and those who have done right can live with God for all eternity. In a world where there's a lot of problems as it relates to marriage and divorce and remarriage, friend, let's realize Jesus was also narrow-minded on divorce and marriage. Look at what Jesus said. I want you to open your Bible to Matthew. I want you to look at two passages with me. One is from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. I want you to look in verses 31 and 32. Matthew 5, verses 31 and 32. Jesus said, Furthermore, it has been said, this is what you've heard, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Now watch what Jesus says, But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except pornea's sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery, and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Turn over to Matthew chapter 19 and hear the words of Jesus again. Matthew chapter 19. They come to Jesus and they say, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And Jesus takes them back to God's original plan. Look in Matthew chapter 19, verse number 8. Jesus said to them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. Whoever marries her who is divorced, commits adultery. You see, Jesus would say in Matthew 19, 6, What well, God's joined together, let not man put asunder. God's law on marriage is simple. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. God wants man and woman, when they join together in marriage, to stay there for life until death does them part. Romans 7, verses 1 through 4. Well, what about divorce? Can you divorce for just any reason? Jesus said, no, that's not God's law. Except for sexual morality, don't divorce. And then and only then does the innocent party have the right 
to remarry. And so God's law on marriage, divorce, and remarriage is very clear as well. One final thing as we conclude today. Jesus was narrow-minded on how to get back to the Father. John 14, 6, Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Jesus was narrow-minded on the one way to the Father. There are not a multiplicity of ways. There are not a multiplicity of saviors. There's one way. Jesus is that way, that truth, and that life. And so, friend, as we think about the idea of salvation today, as we think about the narrow-minded nature of Jesus' teaching, we ask you, have you obeyed the gospel of Christ? Have you done what the Lord says you've got to do to be saved? Friend, we want you to know the things we say today, we say out of love, we say out of kindness and concern for your soul. We want you to be saved and to go to heaven based on your obedience to the truth of God's Word which saves. And so if you've never done that, why not do that today? Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God and the Savior of the world? John chapter 8 verse 24. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins. Are you willing to turn from a, a life of sin to God unless you repent? You'll all likewise perish. Luke chapter 13, verse number 3. Would you confess that beautiful name of Jesus before men? And with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And would you, to have every sin washed away, to be born again, would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Acts 2.38, John chapter 3, verse number 5. Friend, we hope that you'll join us next time as we study more about the gospel of Christ. And may God bless each of us as we strive to live in a way that pleases Him. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and Internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.